If you would take your Bibles and open them to, to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 29. And as you're turning there, you know, uh, before I came to seminary a couple years ago, I used to work in the marketing department of a company that was based in Georgia. This was right after college. I was pretty new to everything at that point. I was only there about a year and a half, but I learned a ton of things in this marketing job. In particular, I learned about how new products are rolled out. People would would work behind the scenes for months and months and months. They would prepare and they would plan and they would get all these things ready. And they would keep this new idea, this new product under wraps until it was time to debut it. And then at the perfect time, it was all planned out, at the perfect time, they would flip the switch. They would announce the new product. They'd say, here we are. Check out what we've got going on. Well, as we've been studying the book of Matthew, we have seen Jesus here work behind the scenes for three years of his ministry. He's been, he's been working. He's been planning. He's been preparing. He's been keeping his identity under wraps. And now, as he enters Jerusalem in the final week before his crucifixion, he flips the switch. No more hiding, no more secrets, no more ambiguity. Here I am. This is who I am. I am the Messiah. And so today, as we continue our study of the book of Matthew, Jesus is going to reveal himself to be the Messiah in three different stories and in three different ways. The first is that Jesus reveals himself to be our merciful Lord. Look at Matthew 20, verse 29. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes. And immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. So Jesus here has been on this single-minded trek towards Jerusalem for the Passover. And on his way, he travels through Jericho. Y'all remember Jericho, right? The walls came tumbling down in Jericho. This is about 1,400 years after those walls came tumbling down. So Jesus comes through Jericho. And as he leaves, there's two blind men who cry out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And they call him son of David. That's a... A messianic term. That means they they know that this is the Messiah. They know who Jesus is. And the crowds rebuke him for making this kind of fuss, but they keep going. They persist. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. So get this. As Jesus approaches the final week of his life, the first to see Jesus, to see him for who he truly is, are two blind men. Catch the irony there? The only people who see Jesus for who he truly is are people who can't see at all. And Jesus hears them. He asks them what they want, and they reply, we want our eyes to be open. And most people would keep a safe distance from these men. I mean, you don't want to touch what they have. You don't want to get the germs or whatever that caused their blindness. But Jesus is different. And in pity, he touches their eyes. And instantly they're healed. Instantly they can see and they follow Jesus. Now usually Jesus follows up on such a healing with a command to be silent. He would usually say, don't tell anyone what happened. Don't tell people who I am. And he would do this because it wasn't yet time for people to know who he was. But you notice he didn't do that on this day, did he? Because at best he is a week away from the cross. There's no turning back and Jesus reveals himself to be their merciful Lord. And the truth is that 2,000 years later, Jesus is still a merciful Lord today. 
He may not always work in the same way He did back then. He may not always heal our physical ailments like He did for the blind men, but He does something far better. He heals our souls. See, Jesus is temporary. His physical healings like this were always meant to point His followers and to point us to the greater, eternal, spiritual healing that is to come. See, this time He cured their physical body. After He died and rose again, He would cure the soul. And one day, when He returns, He's going to cure us entirely. No more blindness. No more hurt legs. No more anything else. And the truth is, we are all like these blind beggars. They, they had a problem uh, that they can't fix on their own, and we do too. Their problem was blindness. Ours is sin. But these blind beggars had the self-awareness to realize, A, I have a problem. B, I need help. And C, Jesus is the one who offers me a solution. In the same way, we need to be self-aware enough to realize that we have a problem. That we need help. And that Jesus alone can offer us the solution. They cried out to their merciful Lord and He saved them. He restored their physical sight. And we need to cry out to our merciful Lord. He will save us and He will restore our spiritual sight. And now, as then, Jesus is our merciful Lord. Have you trusted this merciful Lord yet? Do you have the self-awareness like they did that you have a problem? It's called sin. Do you have the self-awareness that you need help? And that Jesus, and Jesus alone, offers you a solution. The problem is, I think, a lot of us don't realize we have a problem. We, we go about our daily lives. We, we busy ourselves with work or family or hobbies or other things. We're, we're like blind people sitting by our roadside that don't know we're blind. We're like people that... You ever eaten dollar store candy? Now, there's, there's the good dollar store candy, and there's, there's, the, there's the cheap stuff. I mean, it comes in bulk. It's just nasty. You know what I'm talking about? I feel like sometimes we're like people stuffing our face with that cheap, nasty dollar store candy when a king has offered us to come to a banquet. So we do have a problem. It's a big one. We're sinners. We're broken. We're messed up. A lot of times we don't want to see this. But we're people who have rebelled against the holy God of the universe. And every ticking second, Every single moment brings us one second closer to the day when God will judge us for eternity. Don't be blind to the problem any longer. Don't be chewing on that nasty dollar store candy when someone's invited you to a banquet. Confess your sin to Jesus. Tell Him you need help. And like those blind beggars, cry out to your Savior. And when you do that, you have a guarantee from God that Jesus will hear you, Jesus will forgive you, and He will begin the work of restoration in your life because Jesus is a merciful Lord. Second thing Jesus reveals Himself to be here is our modest King. Look here at Matthew 21, beginning in verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them, put on them their cloaks. And He sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before Him and that followed Him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the 
prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. What we just read there is the traditional Palm Sunday story. And if you were in Sunday school this morning, I hope you were, then you already covered this pretty thoroughly. I'm sure Dan and AC really dug in deep and y'all, y'all learned about what this is going on in this passage. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on here, but I, I do want us to look about what this passage says about Jesus. See, as they get closer to Jerusalem, Jesus orders two of his disciples to go get a, don- a donkey and a colt. It's possible he made these arrangements beforehand. It's more possible, more likely, that this is just God's sovereign power at work. Jesus has orchestrated all this to, to fit together at the right time. And either way, he gets the donkey, he gets the colt, and he enters Jerusalem riding on this donkey. And as he makes his way in, crowds surround him and they lay their cloaks on the ground in front of him. They lay palm branches on the ground in front of him. This was kind of like the first century equivalent of laying a red carpet from someone. And as Jesus trots in, the crowd shout, Hosanna, which literally means save. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And people start asking, who, who is this guy you're talking about? And they say, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. They say, this, this is the Messiah. This is our deliverer. This is the one. Now, here's the thing about this entrance, though. Do you think Jesus knows his Old Testament? Do you think? Yeah, he does. Jesus knows the Old Testament. He he helped write the thing, right? He inspired the writing of the Old Testament. Jesus knows that there are key verses, key phrases, which are clear prophecies of the Messiah. That there are certain things he could say, certain things he would do, which would let people know, look, I'm the one you've been looking for. And here, he invokes one of those prophecies, and he reveals himself to the crowds. He basically, by doing this, is saying, I'm the one you've been looking for. But notice how he does this. I mean, he could have chosen any number of prophecies to to make his big announcement. I mean, if, if you were a Messiah, you think you would come in with a bunch of divine fireworks, maybe. Maybe been escorted in by a, a, a fleet of angels or something. Maybe you would have caused a giant earthquake, or, or maybe, maybe he would have showed off his glory like he did to Peter, James, and John. I mean, if anyone could stage a good entrance, I bet it would be Jesus. You'd think he'd do something big and planned a doozy of an entrance. But Jesus chooses to announce his kingship in the most modest way possible. No fireworks, no angels, no any earthquakes or anything like that. He rides in on a donkey. He does this to fulfill prophecies in Isaiah 62 and Zechariah 9. He rides in on this beast of burden. See, rulers rode on donkeys in times of peace. This is Jesus' meek, his peaceful declaration, yes, I am the Messiah. I am the King. And Jesus reveals himself to be their modest King. Now when a new movie comes out, they have what's called the red carpet premiere. You know what that is? The red carpet premiere. They'll they'll have a premiere and the stars will come in in a limo or something and and they'll get out of the car and they'll, they'll walk down this red carpet on the way to see the premiere of their movie. And Photographers are snapping pictures, you know, of them, and they're they're doing interviews with journalists and everything. And the men that are coming in, they have the the nicest, the most stylish suits from from companies that I've never heard of, right there. They're looking sharp, right? And the women come in with dresses that I would imagine cost more than my entire wardrobe. Now, what if the stars walk down the red carpet with some hand me downs? Would that be strange? What if they walk down the red carpet with clothes they bought the Salvation Army? That'd be something they made themselves, right? They would still be announcing themselves as the stars. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one in this movie. But they'd have a much more humble entrance. And I think that's kind of like what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, I'm the star of the movie, but I'm a modest king. And as we think about this and think about, honestly, the whole Gospel of Matthew, I have been just constantly shocked by Jesus' modesty. 
We've been reading Matthew for a while now, and you know we see that he is the king. He is the Messiah. More than that, he is God in the flesh. He is the one who was and is and is to come. He's the one who sustains everything by his word, the one who created the whole universe by uttering a word. And he declares his kingship by riding on a donkey. You know, every single one of us came to church today in something nicer than a donkey. You think about that? If King Jesus is this modest, this humble, what should that say about us? Church, we, we have no room for pride. Absolutely none. We have no need to toot our own horn, to flaunt our accomplishments, no need to be self-important because the king of the universe declared his kingship by riding in on a donkey. Let's model the humility of our modest king. The third thing Jesus is going to reveal himself to be is our mighty prophet. Look at verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Jesus reveals Himself to be our mighty prophet. I mean prophet not just in the I tell the future kind of sense, but prophet is in I tell the truth kind of sense. So Jesus enters this temple here in Jerusalem. If you recall, the temple is the center of Jewish worship. This is where it happened. And on Passover, which was the holiday they were about to celebrate, Jewish people flocked to Jerusalem from all around to worship and to offer sacrifices. I mean, the population of Jerusalem spiked. It went through the the roof. It's kind of like, remember back in Athens, Georgia, where we're from, on game days, right? 90,000 people are packing into the Sanford Stadium. It's like the population of Athens spiked. It was hard to get around. That's kind of what it was like in, in Jerusalem. And since people were coming from so far away during this time, there were little industries that cropped up. There were the money changers. I mean, if you, if you came from far away and you had a Roman currency, they would exchange your money for you and give you a, a, a currency that worked in the temple. So there were the money changers. There were also people who sold pigeons. And you think about it, if you came a long ways away, several days' journey, and you were poor and, and you couldn't bring your sacrifice with you, you'd have to buy it when you got there, right? And that's what they did. The pigeon sellers would, would sell your sacrifice to you when you got there. And this is mainly a thing for the poor. Pigeons were sacrifices for the poor. So you think about it, the money changers and the pigeon sellers were actually providing an important service for the people. There was nothing wrong with these enterprises in and of themselves. But when Jesus arrives at the temple, he sees these things. And he is enraged. In a bit of righteous anger, he literally flips the tables over. Now at this point, we have have never seen Jesus be this angry. So we have to wonder, what is going on? Why is he so upset about this? I think there's two reasons if we look at the text. The first, I think, is he's upset because of the abuse. We are talking about sports earlier. Have you ever been to a major sporting event? And, you know, you're in the hot sun all day, and you're parched, and you're starving, and you go to the concession stand, and you you got, you know, just a little bit of money to buy some food, and you look at the Dasani water bottle, four bucks, right? You look at the hamburger, ten dollars for a single hamburger, right? You're kidding me. This is crazy. When you go to these things, they jack the prices up on you, don't they? Because they know you got nowhere else to go. <laughs> Extortion, right? That's that's why, uh, you know, same thing in a movie theater. You go to a movie theater, uh, a large Coke for six bucks. You know, I could buy like six two liters at the store. 
I think that's what's going on here. Money changers and pigeon tellers would take advantage of the poor. They would jack the prices up because they knew these people had nowhere else to go. Jesus says, look, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You make it a den of robbers. In other words, these people are here to worship and you are extorting them. Shame on you. This passage should teach us, look, Jesus takes greed and extortion really seriously. Particularly among His people of faith. Community of faith is not the right place for making a dime. In other words, we shouldn't cheat or extort anyone, but particularly people of faith. Few things enrage Jesus like taking advantage of your brother or sister in Christ. So one reason Jesus is so upset is because of the extortion, because of the abuse. The second reason he might be upset, and this is a little bit more subtle, Jesus is probably upset about the location of where this is happening. See, the temple in this day had a lot, multiple layers. If you were here when Andy Cook was here, he talked about this. The inner layer was the Holy of Holies. This is where one priest one time a year could go in and, and experience the presence of God. Outside of that, we had what was called the Court of Israel. This is where men could worship. Outside of that, you had the Court of Women. This is where the Jewish women could worship. And outside of that, you had the Court of Gentiles. This was for the non-Jews who worshipped the true God. And there were many of them, non-Jews, who worshipped the true God. Now, do you know where all this money changing and pigeon selling took place? Certainly wasn't in the Holy of Holies. Wasn't in the court of Israel. Wasn't in the court of women. It was in the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles. This was supposed to be the place where non-Jews could come and worship the true God of the universe. This was, as Jesus said, a house of prayer. And in fact, the temple was originally intended as a tool to reach those people, as a tool to reach the nations. If you go back and read 1 Kings 8, it's a Solomon's prayer of dedication for the first temple. Solomon prays a lot of things, but in particular, he prays that people from far countries would come to see this te- temple. And then, and then upon seeing it, they would be so spurred by this great God that they would worship Him. They would worship Him probably in the court of the Gentiles. And if you or I were to get in a time travel ship and go back in time, this is where we would have worshipped. So the temple was supposed to be a place where anyone could come and worship God. It was supposed to serve a missionary purpose where anyone, even non-Jews, could come and worship God. But there, in the court of the Gentiles, the only place where non-Jews could worship, they were crowded out by commerce. As if all those non-Jews weren't important. As if God didn't care about their souls. When Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Do you know what that word robbers can also be translated as? Insurrectionist. An insurrectionist was a Jewish nationalist, someone who thought the Jews were superior to everybody else and they wanted to take violent actions to make that the case. Jesus then is so grieved by the extortion, yes, but also by the ethnocentrism. He is moved to righteous anger. Jesus is a mighty prophet. He is a fierce, a righteous teller of truth, even when that truth hurts. So this passage, I think, teaches us that Jesus takes ethnocentrism really seriously, particularly among His people. Jesus gets angry when people use their race or their skin color or their ethnic heritage as a weapon against someone else. He gets angry when people limit others who are different from them from worshiping the true God. Because the truth is, and the Gospel says, that Jesus came to save people from every country, every language, and every skin color. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, 
God tells Abraham, look, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28, 9-20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And Jesus gives us a little preview of heaven in Revelation 7, 9. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And praise God that this is so, because if that were not the case, None of us would have had a shot. We are all a part of those nations that Jesus was talking about. We weren't born in a Jewish land. We don't have Jewish parents. We're, we're Gentiles from Castellia, North Carolina. Jesus loves and saves people from all nations, all skin colors, all languages, and praise God for it because we have hope because of that truth. And if Jesus loves all people from all nations and all skin colors and all languages, then so should we. You know, talking about race isn't easy. Um, it's uncomfortable. I'm going to be honest, I'm not the best at doing this. But sometimes, oftentimes, in the Gospel, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus takes us to uncomfortable places, doesn't he? I mean, if I look at the stuff that we've had to look through so far, Matthew, we've preached on divorce and remarriage and church discipline and hellfire and brimstone, and every week I'm looking at this and saying, what in the world? If we claim to be his followers, we have to go there with him. As I, as I looked at this passage this week, looked at my own heart, we've got to be honest with ourselves. Because I think truthfully, our religious heritage has messed this up more times than we've gotten it right. I'll tell you a story that puts a face to this. I read a story this week about a man who lived 100 years ago. And it hit me so much because this man was a lot like me. He lived in North Carolina, just like me. He attended the old Wake Forest College before it moved to Winston-Salem. Southeastern Seminary is now on that campus. And so I walked the same paths that he walked. He became a Baptist pastor in Raleigh. I'm a Baptist pastor in Castalia. He wrote a series of, of really popular books. I mean, at their height, one in every eight Americans owned one of his books. And, and those books were turned into one of the most popular movies of his era. You know what? As someone who has illusions of, of writing things that people might want to read one day. I thought, that sounds great. <laughs> At this point, I'm thinking, this guy is just like me. He, he's a Southern Baptist. He's a, he's a pastor. He's an author. These things are the things that I want to be and aspire to do. I wish I could be like him. Here's the thing. You know those books that he wrote? They were a series of novels that are best known for promoting and popularizing racism in America. These books cast blacks as the villains, and this white supremacist pastor and the KKK as the heroes. One out of every eight Americans own these books. The highest grossing movie for decades and all from a Southern Baptist pastor. I can only imagine that had Jesus been here, he would have flipped some tables. Now I say this not to rehash the past, but to ask this question for each of us. Are there any tables Jesus needs to flip in our own hearts? Is there any sense in that you or I think that we deserve anything else more than someone else because of our skin color or where we were born or what language we speak or anything else? Is there anyone who, if they walked in a room, we would think less of them because of any of those factors? Is there anyone you're not looking forward to worshiping with in heaven? 
See, in this passage, Jesus reveals Himself to be the mighty prophet. He's fierce. He's abrasive. He tells the truth. He flips tables. And Jesus loves and saves people from all nations, all languages, all skin colors, people just like you, just like me. As if to put a bow on it, Jesus heals a few more people outside the temple. Verse 14. And the blind and the lame came to Him in the temple and He healed them. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that He did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David! The priests were indignant. They said to Him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to him, Yes. (laughs) Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So as Jesus is healing and people are praising, the priests and scribes are saying, Whoa, 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 Jesus, do you hear what they're saying? They're calling you Son of David. They're calling you the Messiah. Do you have an answer to that? Jesus says, Yeah. (laughs) They sure are. And neither leaves. Jesus is the Messiah. He revealed Himself to be the Messiah. He is our merciful Lord who heals our souls even though we deserve hell. He is our modest King who calls us to humility by His very example. And He is a mighty prophet who turns over physical tables and turns over tables in our hearts. This morning, who is Jesus to you? Let's pray. Father God, we we come this morning to praise King Jesus. God, He is merciful to us. You are merciful to us for giving us a way to have freedom from sin, although we are on our way to hell. God, Jesus is modest. He is humble. God, may we never be have any illusions of grandeur or think we're something better than ourselves because our King was humble to the point of death. And God, Jesus is a mighty prophet. I pray that He would speak truth to our hearts and convict us of any sin that we have harbored deep within our souls. pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You would stand. We're going to sing Hymn of Invitation 281. Speak to my heart. This morning, Jesus is speaking to our hearts through His Word. What is He speaking to you? Let's stand.